Hello and welcome to the swim brief. The head coach of Jersey Wahoos, Paul Donovan. Paul, how are you? Never better, Chris. Thanks for having me. Your your typical response, never better. <laughs> um, I feel like I should address right off the top for people who are this is some, some sort of disclaimer on this podcast because um, you know people listening to it might go, "Hey, is." Uh, is Chris interviewing on his podcast, his boss? And so sort of my first thought is, you know, people listening to it might think like, is this going to be 60 minutes of Chris kissing Paul's butt because um, he brought him on the podcast? And then my second thought was, well, actually, Paul hired Chris, you know, several months ago. So maybe Paul wants to make Chris look good so that he looks smart for having hired him. And then the third thing I thought is maybe you're just overthinking it a little bit and you just settle down. Probably the latter, Chris, right? <laughs> so anyway, we, we got that out of the way. Um, I got a couple uh, themes I, I wanna hit um, with you. And you know, this is like in, uh, I forget what the term for this is in reality TV, but you know, they have these, um, a lot of the stuff you see on a reality TV show is they they don't quite they don't have the cameras rolling when a dramatic conversation happens. So they sort of set the people up and go, "Okay, uh, you've just found out that uh, your uh, brother has committed murder," and go, you know, like. And so they, they, they sort of recreate. So we're gonna recreate. So part of the conversation we're gonna have is gonna recreate. I mean, we're in the office together a couple times a week. Um, and, and some of this stuff we've talked about a lot, uh, but I'd like to talk about it again on, on the podcast. And the first thing is, um, I will start, we'll start with a very uh, general question and see where it goes from there is, how, uh, how does an Irish guy end up coaching in America? What happened? Um, well, um, I suppose if you go go right the way back when I was, you know, finishing up swimming myself, and I was was studying in college, and I was uh, teaching swim lessons, and I was coaching, you know, developmental age kids, and, and and getting more and more involved in the sport as the years went by. This would have been back in the the early noughties. I you know I, I finished high school in in two thousand. Mm. Um, and really, the you know this is before things like podcasts and and information was so readily available on on, on the internet. And my, my big access into the the wider swimming world outside of South County Dublin in, in Ireland was through um, ASCA, through the American Swim Coaches Association, which um, uh, one of my my first bosses had encouraged me to join as a way of of, of getting access to to additional information. Um, so you just become uh, enthused and, and, and fascinated by by the, the sport and the opportunities in the sport that are available in the United States. Um, right the way, you know, from a, from a business end of the learn to swim uh, angle, right the way up into club swimming, um, into the participation numbers to go on through summer swim and high school swim. And then obviously right the way up into the, the NC2A level at the time was, was probably the, the top end of the sport. This was probably right before the era of, of, of pro swimming uh, really yeah. kicked off. And you just look at it and you just go, wow, doesn't that look absolutely amazing? Yeah. And, you know, my kind of thinking at the time, you know, 20 years ago was who wouldn't want to be a part of that? Right. But that's it. It's, it's the pinnacle. Um, so it's, um, you know, it's part of the sport that's always uh, fascinated me and uh, interested me to be a part of and, I suppose then ultimately just wanted to be challenged at, at that really high level as well to see if you can be competitive and be relevant. Yeah, and something we've talked about uh, is that like you listened to the last podcast uh, I put up with uh, Ricky Clausen where he's describing, you know, Danish swim clubs with four or five full-time employees. And that made you check back in Ireland how many people in the whole country <laughs> were full-time employed in swimming? And what did you come up with? Like four? Uh, four or five. Yeah, um, yeah depending I, I, on how I, you I, count it. 
<laughs> how you count it. I think if, you know, I went back after a, a good friend of mine, uh, a guy named uh, Brian Sweeney, who was just a wealth of knowledge on, on swimming and in particular Irish swimming. And, um, and if you go outside the, the, the national system, people who are employed by the national governing body, um, he, he came back with, with four or five names. Um, and a few other people that might be, you know, um, working in swimming full time, whether they're managing centers um, or, you know, a of maybe combining it with lecturing and stuff like that, but actually exclusively just, just coaching full time. He, he said he could count on one hand. Yeah. Um, and 20 years ago, when, when I was coming out of college, um, I know that number was, was even less. You might have had maybe one person. Um, and back then, the, the national system um, and the training centers weren't even in place. So there was, was very few people working uh, full time in swimming and even less working full time in coaching. Um, okay. And that's really what, what motivated me to the first time around. Um, was to get out of Ireland was that I wanted to be a full-time coach. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, there was no path in front of me um, that you just kind of jump on and you'll end up in this career. Um, you could see some of the moving parts happening out in front of you that, that there was going to be some opportunities coming up um, in, in full-time coaching. And I suppose my thought process um coming out of college was, you know, what are the things that I can do um, that are going to put me in a position where I'm ahead of the game. Right. Um, and since I was, you know, in my early 20s and I didn't have that, that experience level, I can't, you know, fast forward time um, and give myself 20 years experience. And yeah. what are the other things that, that, that I can do? Like my, my degree was in economics. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I just felt coming out of it that, you know, there are two things that I was going to do. I was going to go back and get some some formal education in the in the sports world and i was going to get out of ireland and go get some experience and seeing what the um the rest of the swimming world looked like and you ended up as a volunteer coach at, at florida uh, this is actually something i haven't asked you before i mean was it was florida the only volunteer like nca coaching opportunity you pursued was that sort of like you you knew the right people to pursue that one and there really wasn't another option or because uh, I like I remember when I tried to get into college coaching I mean um, this is a guy who could make a whole nother podcast about all my failed attempts uh, to get in at different places how I was turned down to be a uh, volunteer uh, assistant coach at Trinity College in in uh, Hartford Connecticut but like was that it for you or no, no, not at all. I think I, you know, I, I'd gone back and I'd done my, my postgrad in exercise physiology, and you know that that took a, you know a couple of years. And um, the the next part of this, you know, swimming degree was was going to the United States and trying to just get as much experience as possible. So my original thought was that I wasn't going to go to one place. I was going to go and I was going to travel around to multiple venues, maybe spend a week or up to six weeks in in a place and move on and, and take in as many experiences as possible. Um, so, you know, I kind of, you know, and with the help of friends and colleagues, I kind of did up a little list of things that, that I wanted to experience. So, you know, I knew I wanted to experience um, NC2A swimming because yeah. again, that, you know, the front cover of the Ask a Magazine every month was, you know, the head coach of an NC2A program and it just looked like loads of fun. Um, I knew I wanted to get experience of both male and female swimming. Um, and I knew I also was going with, with the idea of, you know, coming back home and, and using this experience. So I wanted to get some experience of programs with an international exposure as well. So, so I, I did up a list and there was a ton of programs on them. And I sent out 10 or 15 emails uh, all in the one day. Um, and I only ever got one reply. And the reply came around 30 minutes after I sent the original email and it was from Coach Troy and um, saying that um, I was more than welcome to, to pop in and see how practice operated over there for, for a couple of weeks. And um, once I got there, I just, I didn't leave. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I changed my plans. I, 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 you know, shelved the idea of going to a load of different places and I just ended up staying in the one place. Um, 
what made you want to stay? Um, or the people. Um, you know, I was, it's like 2006, so I was like 24. And, you know, been away from home, but, you know, I'd never been away from home before. Right. And, um, and the guys over there were, Coach Troy and, and Martin Wilby, and who was the associate uh, head coach at the time, and Anthony Nesty and Pete Knox and Donny Crane, the diving coach, um, they just were just so good to me. Um, made me feel welcome from the very first day, um, included me in things, uh, shared with me, and, and not just the work stuff. I, I think they made, they made sure I was comfortable off the pool deck as well. Um, helped me find a place to stay, helped me get some transportation so I could get around town and stuff like that. And they were just really great. And I just, um, you know, I just felt comfortable there and um, I was made feel welcome and I just didn't want to leave. And, and so what was, uh, uh, you were there for one or two years? Uh, in between. Um, okay. 18 months we'll go we'd like yeah sort of. yeah but you were there through two collegiate seasons yeah okay and you know how did i guess how did being involved with an ncaa program compare to what you had imagined looking at the uh cover of the uh aska you know the, whatever what did they call that aska newsletter it was just called the aska newsletter or was it like the yeah there, there, there was there was a couple. There was the monthly one, which right. is kind of more on just paper, and then there's a more glossy magazine that I think comes yeah. out once a quarter. Some coach um, magazine or whatever, like. Yeah, um, it was, um, you know, like anything. When you actually get a look on the inside, it, it just looks a little bit more normal. Right. Um, um, but by the same token, you're you're in this incredible place, and you you know you've you've worked at you know Georgia Tech and Penn and. Um, you know these these universities, these colleges are just just monsters of yeah. of everything. You know, so you know you walk into to Florida and they you know they have an outdoor fifty meter pool and they have an indoor fifty meter pool side by side. Um, you know the indoor fifty meter pool can be split up into two ten lane twenty five yard pools and it's just right. this. You know, then you walk you know a hundred meters up the road and you're at you know a hundred thousand seater football stadium. Right. And guess what? In the basement of the football stadium is this incredible weight room. Right. Um, so you're, you know, you're blown away, I think, by the, the not just the facilities, but, but the access to them. It right. was like those pools were, were Florida swimming pools. Whenever they wanted them, they, they got, got into the pool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's it very unique. Uh, like um, I think people in America don't realize how unique that is, that access yeah. to facilities. It's incredible. And um, so that was a huge difference to see the, the level of control and ownership um, that the program had of it. And I remember, you know, talking to, to Anthony Nesty about this at one time. And, you know, there's always this talk. And it was the same back in 2006, 2007, 2008 about numbers and programs. And, you know, the trend in high performance programs was to reduce the numbers in it. And you're looking at a place like Florida where there was probably, you know, 30 males, 30 females and a post-grad team. Um, so you was probably 75 athletes in the program. But, you know, I remember talking to Anthony about this and Anthony goes, yeah, but Paul, we've got, we've got five coaches. So if each coach is responsible for, let's say, 15 to 20 athletes. Yeah. Um, and he goes, look at all the access we have to, to all the sport expertise we have in the world. We have the facilities and the water time. We have the strength programs. We have the, you know, the, the physical therapists, we have the nutrition. He goes, how can this not be high performance? Right. And that, that's what it was to me. It was just a, uh, an environment where people were just focused on being exceptionally good all the time. Um, well, well, I also think that environmental thing is when you say that the, the trend in high performance program is, is on reducing numbers, I think that that environment factor is the one that keeps on getting ignored. I, that was right in front of my face in Denmark um, with the idea, like I, I've told you before, that um, I took over a, a uh, top group on a, on a club team, you know, because everybody calls it something different somewhere. We, we have national squad here on Wahoos, but um Mine was called G1 because uh, we were Gentofta, 
Um, so we just did G1, 2, 3, 4. Um, and, you know, there were 12 kids on it. And everybody said to me, like, that's the ideal size for the top group. And I thought, like, are you guys crazy? But it was because at the National Trading Center, that's how many athletes they kept. You know, they had a couple coaches and they kept 12 athletes. And they thought, like, so everybody was trying to emulate that. And I had come, I, as you said to me, you're more of a traditional American than you think. Like I'd come out of the U.S. Uh, club, club and college system where, you know, you have a huge peer group. When you make it uh, up to the top team of a club team, typically in many situations, you have a big peer group. Um, when you swim in college, I like, I didn't swim on a massive college swim team, but there are 50 kids on my team, you know? Um, and that's just, uh, that's just very different. And I think uh, more valuable than just the sheer math of like, oh, well, we could, these resources, if we just put them all into 12 swimmers and 20, 20 swimmers, it would be more efficient or whatever. And I, I think, the, I think it's a mis, I think there's a misconception about the U.S. system as well in that the thing that everybody misses. So, you know, you say Coach Troy goes to a coaching conference in Denmark and he talks about the program of Florida and he talks about 75 athletes and everyone goes, well, 75 athletes. Well, you know, that's crazy. So many numbers, it's five coaches. Right. It says, and I think that's the ingredient that sometimes isn't communicated. I think by the American system very clearly. And I think people from the outside don't appreciate is that there is a ginormous amount of, of coaching resource available to match these high numbers. It is, so it's not like Coach Troy was standing on the side of the pool with, with you know, 75 swimmers in the water trying to coach them. Right. He had in, you know, incredible support around him. And, you know, all the top programs uh, in the country, whether it be at the NC2A level or whether it be at the club level, have a huge amount of coaching resource. Um, yeah. You know, we were having a conversation, of, you know, off camera before the start of it um, uh, about a, a, a program that had 16 full-time coaches. Right. A club program in the United States. So yes, they might have really high numbers of, of, of swimmers, right. um, but they, they, they back that up with a really high coaching resource. And that's one of the things that, uh, you know, at Wahoo's that you, when I look at how we're setting things up here, that's one of the things I look at is our athlete to coach ratio and trying to keep it, you know, depending on the age group, um, but keep it within a certain range. And we never try to go above that one to 20 number. Right. Um, and I think at the college level, it's probably actually a little bit less. Yeah, in the best places, for sure. I mean, I, I know at, at Penn, uh, w when I was coaching there, we were really low on, on coaching resources, and you could feel it. Um, I mean, I could feel it because I was uh, effectively a volunteer coach, and there was so much for me to do because we had, yeah, like 60 athletes, and but then only two full-time people, so that – as a volunteer, the good thing was I got like a lot of hands-on experience because it was like, come on in, you know, like come show up and coach. We've got plenty of coaching to be done. Um, that part of it was really good. But yeah, like at Georgia Tech, um, we had all the coaching. We, we, we were technically down a coach, but we had, I think we had more than enough um, people to staff what we were doing and um you know it was it really was a, an embarrassment of resources in some ways um what we could what we could leverage on things yeah so uh beyond like the general of college swimming um one thing i'm i'm always curious about and i'm always asking you about is uh coach troy himself, uh, because I think like, uh, and I count myself in this camp, maybe not as much anymore. Um, but I, I get the sense from you that, uh, you think there's a lot of misconceptions about him. Um, what are, what are some things like that you see people sort of, what kind of assumptions do you think people make about him that just aren't in your experience true? I think just generally, I, I think sometimes when I talk to you about this, I think the, there's a lot of uh, 
the, the internet fuels misconceptions about people because your people are making assumptions without without any information and without any knowledge or experience. Right. Um, and you get real deep into it. I, I don't want to get into you know anything about free speech or anything like that with everything right. that's going on in the world right now. Right. right. But but it does give a platform to people to put out um, opinions not based on experience. Yeah, know, again, we've never had you know, more secondhand information yeah. about everything yeah. and less firsthand information about everything. <laughs> yeah, um, so I think that's that's one of the, the things and um, just generally that goes on out there. And the same can be said about every single successful um, coach and every single sport. I'm sure this morning the, the internet's filled of people with uh, their own opinions on Nick Saban and, um, and all that stuff that have never even you know seen an interview with him or uh, before they even had the opportunity to come across him in person. That's just the, the nature of the, of the beast. Um, specifically with, with, with Greg, you know, my experience was just a different one. It was um, you know what I saw at a personal level was a was a um, you know, just a, a re really kind and, and helpful person, um, extremely demanding in, in his professional environment. There's no, no doubt about that. Yeah. Um, but by, by the same token, like one of the big things I took away from my, my time in Florida was how important the, the individual relationships you build with the people you work with are. Um, and it was something that, that, that I, I saw him and all, the other staff do as well constantly was, spend time individually with people to, to work and, and build good relationships. Um, so I think sometimes the, the, the persona people, you know, say they see uh, um, a very demanding person um, that that can paint a different picture to the reality of a very demanding person who also is there in the background fostering and building those relationships with an individual. Um, so, you know, and I, we spoke about this before, Chris, I don't, you know, some of the other people love in, in swimming to talk about um, training philosophy and, and training concepts and, and stuff like that. So, um, um, you know, the, you know, one of the big things that people would always, you know, label Coach Troy on was that they, you know, swims a high volume program. I think one of the things is, you know, if you've been coaching for 45, 50 years, you went through a period of time in that history where high volume was the thing to do. And um, so you get labeled with that because pretty sure a lot of people went down that road. But um, in my experience, it was, um, um, he did some volume with some people, he did less volume with other people and he did even less volume with some other people at different times. And it was just always a, you know, a very fluid and very, um, uh, a moving conversation with different individuals around what they needed. So it was not the case of every day coming in and going 10,000 yards. Right. Um, there were some days when people came in and went 3,000 yards. Um, and there were some days when people came in and went 6,000 yards. And then there were some days when people came in and went 10,000 yards. Yeah. Um, but, but the athletes always, I felt, always had a pretty good idea of what the plan was, uh, what the purpose was and why they were doing what they did. And I think maybe that's the bit that gets lost in the, the commentary online. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say those were my misperceptions. Uh, I would say, like, I thought he was mean. <laughs> I've never met him. So, like, I'm admitting to all the things. I thought he was mean. Uh, I thought he was, you know, kind of a dinosaur. Like, you know, he's just uh, hasn't changed anything he's done training-wise from... 1982 or whatever and he's just was just showing up and uh throwing some really long hard practices at people that that was that was the perception i had um before i met you uh, as to what was um, going on there i i just never saw any of that uh, yeah. in my time there and in the the 12 years since and all the conversations that we've had um i I couldn't think anything is further from the truth. I think uh, um, he's, he's constantly changing what he does. And I don't think you, you keep yourself relevant uh, in, in any profession uh, in life at the top end of, of the global trend 
without being um, self-reflective and without changing. Yeah. Um, so, um, but yeah, I would, I would never have, have um, thought any of those things about him. And I think when I look at, you, you know, top end performers in anything, um, I'd always make the opposite assumptions. Um, um, They're kinder than we have, think. <laughs> and... kind, kinder than we think. Um, I think because you got to look past the, the public persona and you look at the individual relationships that, that they foster. Um, and uh, the other thing I'd say about, about kind of elite level performers is you have to be pretty focused on your own environment. Um, and sometimes then that might come across to the outside world as being a little bit, bit short and gruff with everything else that's going on. But maybe that's just because you're laser focused on what's actually important, which are the relationships that you have and the people that you're working with. Um, yeah. so. I, I think that describes to a T Terry McKeever in my experiences with her. Like I've met so many people who think that she is uh, standoffish or gruff or kind of, you know, unfriendly. Um, I've not experienced that at all when I've met her, but I know she's laser focused on what she's doing. And she's not like, she's not always looking for an opportunity to uh, invite everybody in to just like sort of uh, see everything and uh, experience everything. And I, I kind of don't blame her for that too, because I think that too, she's been somebody who's been purposely targeted online for criticism. There's just some people just really, um, I've always said, actually, one of my goals in my coaching career is to be viciously, viciously attacked um, in an online forum because you, because nobody viciously attacks me, Paul. I'm not as big a fish as uh, Greg Troy or um, Terry McKeever. You have to get to a certain level before people lose their mind over you, you know? Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm just not quite sure anymore that, and, you know, if you, again, we, we spoke earlier about, you know, when I'm coming out of college and trying to forge a career, um, the aspiration to be a big, big fish might have been quite high back yeah. then. Um, I think as you go on and things that that aspiration probably matures and, and, and grows a little bit. And, um, you know, like most things in life, when you when you stop looking for it, it's probably closer than it ever has been at any other stage beforehand. Yeah, um, and maybe that's just just part of the journey as well. Um, is this but, are you giving you know, career not, advice now? Is this? I'd, ne I'd never, never, ever try to give anybody <laughs> career advice. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to uh, uh, translate what you're saying here to to my. Well, I think I just think it's one of the things, and like you know, I, you know, I use the the internet on a daily basis, and you know, I, I read all the stuff that goes up there and all the rest of it. But um, one of the things I learned, you know, in my my, my previous job and at home in, in Swim Ireland, and um, for 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 eight years, I was the head coach of of um, our national training centre in Dublin. And um, one of the things I, I learned in, in that time was that um, it can be very lonely um, being at the top of a tree, um, top of a coaching tree, or, or in, a, in a place where you know people might 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 look to take you down a peg from, um, and um, and also not to believe everything people say. Um, so whenever I see any of these things or when I hear people said about these things, I, I try to keep a much more open mind than I would have 10 years ago um, to the point where I, I try not to form uh, any opinions at all because right. I don't have enough information to be able to do that and it's not fair. And you know, preach to the kids all the time, you know, you know, treat others as you'd like to be treated yourself. Right. And well, if we extend that into our own profession, into the coaching community, um, you know, I wouldn't like to have stuff thrown at me without people having accurate information of a situation. So I really try to to keep a clear head in these things and and not to not to read too much into it. And if I have the opportunity to meet people and form my own opinions, then that's a much better way to go about it. Right. 
Uh, so let me segue into our uh, second topic here by asking a really uh, uh, basic question. This is, you talked about Greg Troy, you know, this perception that um, he was a high yardage coach. Do you think you're a high yardage coach? Would you consider yourself that? Um, I don't know. Uh, what's high yardage? Seriously, is it 3,000 yards an hour high? It might be to someone. Hey, if I tried to do 3,000 yards in an hour, I'm telling you now, I oh, think yeah. it's pretty high. <laughs> um, but I think... Um, if I tried to do 3,000 yards, period, it would be high. <laughs> um, do I think I'm a high yardage coach? Um, I don't know, uh, is the honest answer. I, I would put it like this. I am not the highest yardage coach out there i'm not the lowest yardage coach out there I, i'm in that area of gray where i think most things in life exist yeah um, and i had this I had this conversation with a with a swimmer uh, only yesterday um who was was asking a question about training and stuff like that and they're asking a question about yardage and content and stuff like that and, and the answer i gave was look what we try to do is we try to do whatever we have to do to be the best we can be and that's what I'm laser focused on. Yeah. So when I'm sitting down and, and writing practice, is there a number in my head that, that I try to stick to? Yeah, for sure there is. Because I think that it's a metric and all metrics are useful. And um, when you're trying to, to measure what you're doing and when you want to reflect on what you have been doing, you need as much information as possible. And it's the easiest thing out there that, that we, can, we, can, we can count on. Um, is it the be all and end all? Absolutely not. If I've done, you know, um, if I've done 200 yards short of 15,000 yards in a practice, am I going to be scrambling to get that extra 200 in? No. No. Um, if I go a couple of hundred over because I felt they needed a bit more swim down and we had some more available time, am I going to shut them down because I've hit a number? Absolutely not. Um, but by the same token, is it a is it a, a data point that I use in my planning? Absolutely, every single day, um, and I use it with all all the coaches at Wahoos that we work with, um, as a way of just keeping a, an eye on um, some of the things that we're looking to accomplish. Um, yeah, I would say that's been that, probably the biggest change for me. Is uh, I was telling uh, somebody on the phone last night, like. Um, and you can tell me whether, well, it's too late now because I'm going to admit to them anyway, but you know, a couple shocking uh, revelations I made to you was first that this year was the first year I ever made a season plan for um, any team I've coached, uh, you know, which sort of comes up simply as in college coaching, nobody ever asked me to make a season plan. And when I became head coach, therefore, I was like, why should I make a season plan? I've gotten this far without making a season plan. This is the first time I've ever made a season plan. And um, the first time I've really actually been tracking my workouts and getting any feedback on what my workouts are. You know, like you and I have a conversation uh, once every three weeks, at least, about uh, what's going on in the, the groups that I coach here. And I simply just have never, never done either of those things before working here yeah <laughs> you're just gonna well, say yep it's not really a question um, in there uh, so uh, i think i think two things i think again this kind of goes back to the, the the yardage thing i think if somewhere along along the way it became um the done thing to say that that you don't count how many yards you do and you, you don't really plan and to both those things to anyone that actually says them, I'd be, I'm really fascinated by it and um, because there's a huge amount of successful people out there that, that, that operate that way. But I think they're, I think sometimes they're doing a disservice to their own coaching and their own methods, because if you think about what you're doing and you're working towards a goal, then you have right. a plan, right? Just because it's not written down on a piece of paper and the, the USA Swimming or Swim Ireland template that they send out or is available on the website doesn't mean that you don't have a plan. Right. You know, if you, if you have a, had a conversation with an athlete 
about their goals and things you're going to do to help them accomplish them, then you have a plan. Um, it just has, you know, if you're presenting the information in, in a different format to the traditional way of presenting it. Um, and they're the same thing with, with, um, with the, the count and the volume and the workouts um, or even writing out workouts. Just, I'd say the same thing. If you've spent time sitting down, even if it's 10 minutes before practice or even if it's for the 10 minutes during the warm up and you're looking to see how the kids are, but well, you right. are planning practice. Right. You are not just randomly making stuff up and doing it. Um, and so I, I sometimes, you know, again, if I put myself back 20 years ago, if that was the information I was getting, I'd have been worried for myself going down that path because it's not a way I can operate. I, I'm much more of a on paper guy. And yeah. that's just how, how I work best. Um, but I think everybody plans and, and everybody tracks. I, I think it's just done differently for, for, for different people. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I definitely had a point in my life where, uh, you know, I was just super young and my working memory was so good. Like I would remember all the good sets, you know, so why write them down? Um, I don't find uh, that that comes as easily uh, to me. And I, I think like probably the most prominent, I mean, two people really uh, come to mind when you when you talk about this. One of them is is Salo. I think that a lot of people would attribute the don't count yardage sort of mantra to him and the uh, I'll come up with practice as they're swimming. I think most people would attribute to Eddie Reese. Um, but uh, one of the things that we studied and when I was uh, uh, doing my master's in, in positive psychology was intuition. And like, how does intuition work? You know, because there's all sorts of psychological research out there that says basically um, what we think of as intuition improves actually as you get older. Um, and so the theory is uh, not necessarily that there's actually this uh, instant, instantaneous, like, you know, magical sense of what's going to happen, but that, you know, your, your brain forms pathways. So I, I would imagine Eddie Reese has been coaching swimming for so long that he, it, a lot of the, maybe even the thought that goes into how he constructs practice is unconscious to him, but his mind is constantly working on it. And it just knows faster after seeing something in the water, like we should do this next. Like, and it has all sorts of directions it can go in based on the feedback. I read a really good New York Times profile on Jim Steen, who was the longtime coach of Kenyon College in the US, uh, sort of a like lesser known guy, but I mean, won 30 consecutive division three titles and division three something is actually pretty competitive in the US. Um, and uh, the New York Times uh, reporter was flabbergasted because she came to observe a practice and um, they were going through all this stuff and they were practicing some relay starts. And in the middle of them practicing these relay starts with the, with the little um, you know, sensor pad, he sort of casually turned to her and he said, she's gonna fall start. And sure enough, the swimmer jumped early off the blocks. And to me, this is just another instance of Jim Steen sees something before, before his intuition tells him the way that the person is behaving will lead to this outcome. Um, so I think, you know, it's what, what the, what that whole story is. I think it's a mistake as a young coach to go, well, Eddie Reese doesn't write his practice down. You know, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, that means I shouldn't write what my practices are down. It takes a, a long time to um, build up that thought process so that you actually do have a robust planning, just not as much of it happening uh, necessarily on a page. I think there's the other side of it is that you, you, you mentioned, you know, you mentioned guys that are at the top of their game. Right. And um, they're some of the best in the, the history of our profession. Um, I think when you talk about things like planning and and um, 
and writing practices, I think when you start off, I think you have to more for, fall into what's best practice. Um, not, not what the, the one or two superstars are doing, but what's best practice? Because I right. think if you fall into a best practice model, um, you give yourself a, a, a range of experiences and then you can, you can deviate off into whatever direction you find is going to work best for you through your experience. Because I think, you know, when you talk about planning, like there, there's definitely, there's a theory side to planning um, that you have to go and learn. Um, whether that's learning just by talking to, to, to a mentor or whether you go through some more formal um, education process. Um, but there's definitely a theory side to planning around, you know, you know having a, a multi-year plan, an annual plan, a, a training cycle, a weekly outline, constructing an individual practice. There, there's theory that's applicable across a load of, of sports that, that's available and out there. And I think you have to have a knowledge of what that is for your own best practice model and to create yeah. your own framework. Um, so there's the, there's the theory side of it. The other side of planning that I think people have to learn how to come to what is just the reality of planning is that, you know, it's not all in your control. Yeah. Part of, of doing a good plan is looking at the, the information that's out there. So in our sport specifically, you know, you'd be looking at swim meets and what dates they're on. Because unless you're creating all your own swim meets to fit your perfect plan, you right. know, there are some, some immovable objects that have to go into it. Um, and um, so you've got to look at the reality of, of planning, you know, you know, Wahoos were working with, with you know, school age kids. So we've got to take in to consideration the academic year. You know, there's right. no point going to making our big swim meet on the Saturday where the, the SATs are on. Yeah, that's that's not good for the kids. Right. Then, then they have to make a really awful choice, you know, awful choice. Yeah. So, you know, I think there's the, the reality side of it. And then then you get down into the content side of it. And really, to me, that's the, the fun bit of it, because the content side of it is is really where you, you as a coach or me as a coach, I get to express myself um, and I get to explore different ideas and different theories. And that's where I go get to take that comment from from a really great coach and put it into my content and run with it and explore it and see where it goes and see how I can adjust it to make it work for, for the athletes that I'm, I'm working with today. Um, and it's, it's kind of like, you know, to me, that planning side of it, you know, it's the closest thing to the, the, the experience and exploration that I really enjoyed as a swimmer or, you know, as a student that I'm, I'm still getting back out of the sport now because it's where I can express myself. Um, but I, I do think that before you get to that point, I think you, you, you've got to have the, the theory side of it, some exposure to it. Um, I'm not saying you need to go do a, a PhD in exercise physiology or anything, but you have yeah. to have some, some basic uh, knowledge. And I think you have to just understand that, that there is no perfect plan, um, um, that there are, are some things that would just be fixed in it. Um, and then, then you can kind of go from, from there with it. So um, let me get more specific. I mean, just for the people listening, cause I think, you know, a lot of people, one of the feed piece of feedback I get is like, people want to go like, ask him, you know, ask those people what they're actually doing. So how do you, I mean, right now, when you're planning and practice for national squad, how do you, what's your process? Um, well, I, you know, Obviously, there's been a few, few steps before we get to the actual writing of practice. There's, there are those few steps that we have to go through and that we have a, you know, we, we, we have a multi-year plan um, with, with the kids. Um, you know, so, for example, with the, the national group at Wahoos, you know, in a normal circumstances, we have four years to, to work with the kids. So we've got to have a rough, and again, it's, you know, the longer the, the, the plan, the less specific it is in it. Um, right. But you still have to have some knowledge. So we have, we have four years working with them and we want them getting better each year. Yeah, It's not just all about in year one and, and reach their full potential and then just kind of, you know, ride that wave out for another three years. That's not going to work. Um, so so we, we have a multi-year plan where we're looking at very at a very high level what we're, what we're looking to accomplish um, with, with the kids. They come into the program. And then, you know, you break that down into, into the annual plan. 
And again, it's real simple in the in the US. It's, you have a short course season and a long course season. Um, so we'll have a priority meet at the end of the short course season and a priority meet at the end of the long course season that we're we're working towards. And um, and we'll have have meets um, in there uh, every ideally every every four weeks. Um, but again, that's that's a bit of it you can't control. So maybe sometimes there's only two weeks apart, and maybe sometimes there's three weeks apart. But you know, we we don't want to go more than than four weeks in the season without racing because that's what the kids enjoy. Can I can um, I interject with a question? Do you think it's sure. good? Do you think it's good that America has such a long short course season? Um, is why do you think it's so long? Well, I think. First off, I think it's so long because uh, we have so many short course pools. And we have so many yards pools. It's just it's just the easiest facility to get organized around in the U.S. I think um, you have that college season traditionally running through the end of March, um, so there's some synchronicity with that. And I happen to think it's one of our biggest advantages. Like, and I don't know if that's true. I mean, you know, the, 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 the problem with being the most successful swimming country in the world is that uh, it can tend to have this halo effect. That's right. Like everything we do is the best, you know? So yes, I could make the argument that like a long short course season is really great, but maybe it's, maybe it's hurting us. But I, I think it helps because I think the kids get a lot of racing experience. I think they get a lot of skill experience. I mean, you have to be very skilled to swim in short course. Obviously long course is sort of more about uh, what kind of engine you've built for pure swimming. But I think when you get to the international level, like you can just see that starts and turns and um, underwaters and stuff like the, the US is really dominant in those, those phases. And I think it's because yeah. of a lot of short course swimming. Um, so when I swam um, in the 90s, um, there was no 50 meter pools in Ireland. Okay. And we still sucked. <laughs> so. <laughs> but there could have been so, a lot of other reasons for that, Paul. <laughs> there, there, there was. And there but was. I also think there's a lot of other reasons why the US is so successful. As yeah. Well. Okay. Um, go, go back so to your plan. I, you know, <laughs> uh, um, so I think. <laughs> The, um, the short course season, it is a bit longer than the long course season, but it ties in well with the NC2A system, which is ultimately for the majority of kids, that's what the goal is. Yeah, that's the terminal kids point. Who swim, yeah, so when I talk about that multi-year plan, my, my, my main thought process in that multi-year plan is how am I going to help those kids get a free education? Because, you know, it's something we take for granted. But back home in Ireland, everybody gets a free third level education. The government yeah. pays for it. Um, I, you know, in grand total to do my degree, it cost me 2000 euro, which is around two and a half thousand dollars, um, in fees, you know, there's a registration fee of 800 uh, euro at the start of every year that the government did not pay. Um, everything else was, was on them. Um, so when you come over here and you look at some of the figures that are, are they're the reality of what, what kids, um, and families have to have to plan for. Um, well, swimming can be an outlet to circumnavigate that and give them an opportunity to, to get a higher education and to still swim, which selfishly I think is fantastic because I love the sport and want to see more people swimming. Um, it is really in that multi-year plan. And even when we go right the way down into the, the younger groups and Wahoos where we're trying to build them up, really that's what the end goal is for the majority of swimmers. Um, and I think that, that is the U.S.'s greatest strength. Not, not their short course swimming, because back home, um, from a very, very, very early age, if you're not going to be an Olympian, people start asking, what's the point? Right. That's, that's awful. It'll break your heart. Um, no, I mean, I, I, I saw the same thing in Denmark. There's, first off, we would have a huge, huge drop off in the first year of secondary education, what they call gymnasium there, where kids would be... A, uh, it would, it, it would, first off, many kids would transition to their senior team, transition from one school to another, and transition from being an age group swimmer to a junior swimmer all in the same year. And it, 
like the the weight of those three transitions meant that we just bled swimmers at 15 but if we didn't bleed them at 15 it was you know the end of high school so 19 years old and um you're i think you're right about that like the the, the college system the fact that we just keep so many 18 to 22 year olds training and competing is a huge advantage but I, I'd go back a step. I think it's the fact you're keeping so many 12 to 18 year olds competing with the possibility of, of having their education paid for that that is the, the best thing about it. Like I, I look at the, the, you know, you look at the national team at Wahoos, um, you know, two and a half years here, and we've gone through an incredibly difficult time for, for, for everybody in the world with, with COVID. Had very few people drop out. Yeah. Minimal. I count on one hand. Yeah, I've had left people drop out and there are full time coaches in Ireland, um, <laughs> you know, so it's so there is that motivation and excitement for them to stay involved. There's that reason for them to stay involved. Yeah. Um, so I think that's that's a great thing. So, you know, we go back to the planning stuff with the, the short course season. It ties in with the NC2A season, which is ultimately what these kids are aspiring to try and be a part of. So I think it works, works well. And. It's not like long course swimming is, is slow in the States. It's incredibly fast. Um, you know, junior nationals is as fast as junior Europeans. So, you know, the, the whole of the continent of Europe. And, and it's not as deep. Junior Europeans is not as deep as junior nationals. No. Um, it can sometimes be a little bit better on the top end, but but yeah. definitely not as deep. I mean, part of that probably, too, is just limitations of how many athletes a country yeah. will bring in certain events. Sure. but. But not really. Oh, yeah, no, it doesn't explain more, all. <laughs> doesn't mean, no, but there are, no, you're right. There are more nuances to it than, than just that. Right. But so I think that the short course season works well. So we come in and we'd have our annual plan and, you know, said we'd have our priority meet at the end of, end of March um, and um, our priority meet at the, the end of the summer. And, and I, I think that's where some of your philosophy starts kicking in. So, you know, at Wahoo's, you know, one of the, one of the statements we try to, to live by is, you know, we're always going to go to that you know, highest level of available competition. And that's what we're going to aspire to. And in the United States, that's at the national level. So we, we're going to have an aspiration um, to, to compete and be successful at the national level. Um, so when we're selecting what meets we're going to go to, that obviously play, plays into it as well. Um, so when we're looking at that, 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 that annual plan and that kind of priority meet, the end of March and you know the end of July or into early August. I think when we're looking at our competition selection, as we go back in that, we're we're trying to make decisions that are going to support performance at that, that goal. So one of the 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 quotes that you know, again you know Ireland very close to Great Britain, we got a lot of exposure to to British swimming and the the coaches and expertise uh, over there. And when when Bill Sweetnam was in charge over there. He used to have a, a philosophy with, with his, his national team that they compete, um, you know, yeah, three times at their you know, current level of performance, twice above it and once below it. Hmm. Um, so we get plenty of opportunities to compete at our current level of performance. So when I'm looking at my, my annual plan, I'm always looking for a couple of opportunities where I can go bring the, the kids who are all high school age kids that I work with to a level of competition that's above that level. And again, the opportunities in the U.S. with the pro series, uh, pro swim series, um, winter long course nationals, they're just abundant out there. So, yeah. but that's another factor that I try to, to put into the annual plan is always try to find those two opportunities to go bring the kids and compete at a level above their current level of performance. So you're constantly exposing them to that next level up, constantly putting pressure on them and constantly trying to provide some learning opportunities for them to, to figure things out. Um, because the, the other thing I think when you're, you're planning is that you've, you've got to take some risks and you, you got to have no fear. You got to trust the kids to figure it out. Yeah. Um, but, but part of that figuring out is that they might fall flat in their face a few times and you've just got to be there to, to, to help them through that, to, to keep them going. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when we look at the annual plan, that's, that, that there are a couple of factors that we, we try to try to put in there um, and and then you know you get into the fun stuff of kind of your, your training cycles and your your weekly outlines and your 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 you know, 
daily content of, of practice. And um, I think once you have that, that framework of what you're going to do, the rest of it can be a little bit more, more fluid and a little bit more, um, you know, in the moment. So, you know, my, my personal practices, I try, I try to plan once I've got that annual plan done and I know what we're working towards and I know where the checkpoints are along the way. Um, I try to plan uh, three weeks in advance um, and then three days in advance at a bit more of a specific level. Yeah. And I just keep repeating that process right the way through the season. Give, give, give people like, I'm going to go all the way down to the specific. Like, what do you guys do at practice last night? We're talking uh, about a Tuesday. Yes, so, there's so, Monday. So what happened on Monday? What's that? <laughs> Yeah, no, sorry, I thought you said, yeah, no, no, I, I hear you. What, what do we do on Monday nights? On Monday night, we we um we were going to medley set. Um, and we're kind of in a extended phase of training. We were, we were really lucky with all that's going on. We got to go to a um, mid-Atlantic swimming, put on a winter juniors meet um, in, in Pennsylvania, um, kind of early to mid-December. So we got to go and, and compete at that with, the you know 20 odd kids that, that qualified for that opportunity but you know then the the state of new jersey went into another uh, not not a lockdown but youth sport was restricted so training was on pause um and obviously we couldn't plan any competitions right um, so we were kind of in this now extended phase of just training kind of a six-week period where we were just going to train which that's something else in in my annual plan i'm, I'm always looking for two to three six week periods of uninterrupted training yeah. um, where, where there is no distraction because kids want to swim well when they go to a swim meet, but sometimes you just need a, a period of time to be able to settle down and consistently repeat some of the things you want to get better at. So that's something else. When I look at that annual plan that I'm, I'm looking for, you might not always find it. it might not always be possible with dates and meets and school holidays and all that stuff, but I'm always looking for it. And I try to get as close to that, that as possible. But last night of practice, we're in this just period of just just kind of pretty focused training at the moment. Um, it, it was a, a, a medley themed day, so um, um, we kept the majority of the group together, just doing the, the same practice, which wouldn't always be the be the case, but it was yesterday. And um, we always try to start practice off um, with some some skills and drills. So they're starting off practice. As my theory is, if they start correct, there's a better chance of them staying correct. Yep. Um, so the first part of practice was that, and we moved into some pulling. Um, because as we spoke about, um, yes, we had an email correspondence email, about pulling. Yes, <laughs> pulling was is a big theme that we're trying to work on with them. So we did a little bit of freestyle pull and backstroke pull, um, and then we went into the the main set, which was um. um I'm not big on terminology, um, um, but for, for, for one, in, in my head, when we're doing sub-maximal work, yeah. so I think you have your, your quality work, right. which is your race-specific, race-relevant, um, whatever people want to call it. To me, it's just diminishing returns. Right. You, you're performing at, at such a high level that it is unsustainable. Yeah. They aren't going to go two hours of practice at this level. It's not possible. And if they if could, it, was, it wouldn't be there maximal effort wouldn't be their maximal effort so <laughs> i think you know you, we've got our kind of you know diminishing returns training where we're trying to repeat as often as possible race specific and race relevant um, components of, of of their performance and then i think below that you've got your kind of submaximal work um and to me the, the value in the submaximal work is that you can get in a ton of repetitions so maybe this will answer your question about the volume side of things at the um, end, you're going to tell me how many yards the practice was. You will tell me that figure. Yeah, it was, it was 8,800. Okay. In two hours and 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, but um, I think in that sub-maximal work, you can do an increased amount of repetitions. And if the kids are clear on what the skill they're trying to repeat is, and you're clear in your communication to them and feedback to them around how they can do that better, um, they're, they're, I, I think that's just the most important thing in the sport, because if you look at um, leave swimming to one side and our biased opinions around training volume and training intensities and the weird relationship we as a coaching profession have with those things. Right. Um, 
if you just look at skill acquisition as a theory across anything that people are looking to perform in, um, much smarter people than me would say that skill acquisition happens in three stages. Yeah. There's stage one where you've got to learn the skill. So to me, that's, you've got to be able to do it correct once. Right. Um, stage two is you've got to repeat the skill and you've got to take that, you know, conscious act and make it an unconscious habit. Yeah. And that can take weeks to months right. of, of consistent repetition. Actually, a lot of people and, say six weeks is like a magic number for that. So it's interesting you mentioned really? six weeks. Okay. All right. I read, I remember I read a book called The Power of Habit. Um, um, I, and I gave this out as a Christmas present to uh, uh, my coaching colleagues a few years ago. It, it meant so much to me. But anyway, their theory, they actually took smokers. Mm. And their, their theory was that, yes, look, there is people are addicted to smoking, but there's a huge amount of, of habit involved in, in cigarette smokers as well. And they, they, they said three to four months to, to break that habit. Yeah. To break the habit of, of having something in your hand or the habit of walking outside at 9 p.m. at night, you know, to have a cigarette or whatever it may be. So either way, it's an extended period of time yeah. where you've got to. De- and to me is if, if you, know, you go back to Coach Troy is if, if some is good, more is better. Mm. Um, if it's been done well. Right. Um, and then the third level of skill acquisition is starting to perform that skill under pressure which to me is your quality training and your swimming performance. That's why it's important to go to swim meets regularly. Yeah. So you're putting those skills under pressure. Um, so, sorry, I deviated there. So I don't know if it was, you know, an aerobic set or endurance set. It's a sub-maximal level of work where we're trying to get in an increased amount of repetitions. And um, we, with the national team, we work off a kind of average of around 4,000 yards per hour. And that's that's sub maximal work for them. So the set they did last night was a medley theme. It was uh, four two hundred and fifties free IM, uh, double the backstroke, yeah. and then four one fifties backstroke um, descend, four two hundred and fifties free IM, double the breaststroke, four one fifties breaststroke, and then four two hundred and fifties free IM, double the freestyle at the end, and they really tried to descend that last one hundred down to to their best effort. Nice. So right. we have a couple of different intervals going on. We have a, we have an A, B, and C interval at, at most practices that we do. So, so the A guys were going off 115, the B guys off 120, the C guys off 125, and then the breaststroke obviously a little bit slower. Right. Breaststroke we're going off 125, 130, and 135. Got it. Well, we've been talking for an hour, so that means Paul, we have to get to the lightning round. And as I told you, I have a very every other part of this podcast, you you at least had some sense of what is coming, but I prepared a very special lightning round for you. And at one, I had I, I had a lot of different kind of ideas. One of them was I was just going to torture you as I like to do in the office with things, you know, things that are Scottish, pretending that they're Irish. Um, I'm still confused about Dexie's Midnight Runner, which is apparently neither Scottish nor Irish. But Paul, they sing two ra lu ra lu ra ah. You know what? Well, I lived in Ireland for for 35 years, and I never heard anyone say two ra lu ra ra la or whatever. So I'm, I'm not quite sure if, if that is is a very Irish thing to say or not. Well, anyway, once I introduce this idea, you are you. I think you're really going to like it. So I got on. Uh, Wikipedia. And I read the Wikipedia pages of uh, two world class soccer players, or as you would call them, footballers. Okay. Michael Laudrup and Roy Keane. And what I'm going to do to you uh, is I'm going to read quotes from their Wikipedia article. And I want you to guess is this Michael Laudrup's? Wikipedia page, or is this Roy Keane's Wikipedia page? Okay. I'll do my best. All right. First one, a world-class playmaker. Is Michael Ladrup. That's correct. You're one for one. There's no bias in these, by the way. I mean, uh, you know, obviously everybody knows that Michael Laudrup is a little bit better than Roy Keane. 
So, um, you know, there's no, but there's been no bias. I tried to fairly represent both players. <laughs> Number two, a dominating box to box midfielder. That's Roy. That's correct. I need to, I need to, if I get really advanced, I'm going to put a ding, like, you know, post, post process <laughs> uh, sound in here. Okay. Three, his most prominent traits were his stamina, intelligence, dot, 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 positional sense. Roy. Roy Keane, three for three. Maybe you were more prepared for this than I thought. His it's number four. His vision, speed of thought, and passing were on a different level. Roy? Oh, that one's Michael Laudrup. Mm, I don't know. I, I'd say Roy is pretty good at those things, too. <laughs> uh, uh, well, it's not in his Wikipedia page. For You know, you, you need <laughs> to take issue with whoever true. wrote the Wikipedia page if you, if you think that they should have included that about Roy Keane. I suppose the real question, Chris, is, is is Wikipedia more or less accurate than the swim swam comment section? It's very accurate, in, in my opinion. Okay, number five, there's a little context. Um, so a three-time European player of the year describing him said, he's one of the most talented players ever. And he only lamented his lack of selfishness causing him to score too few goals. Which player was he Roy? describing? Roy? No, that was Loudrup again. <laughs> All right. Number six. And I say there's no bias in these. The most genius player the world has ever seen. This is a quote from Javier Clemente. Um, again, well, I'm going to answer with my heart and say that's definitely Roy Keane. That was Michael Laudrup again. <laughs> okay, number seven. Was named by Pele to the FIFA 100 list of the world's greatest living players. That's probably Laudrup. It's both. Okay. So there's a trick That's question good. in there. See? Trick question. <laughs> okay, number eight. We got two more left. His greatest gift was to create a standard of performance which demanded the very best from the team. Oh, that's definitely Roy. That's Roy Keane. And finally, number nine, widely regarded as one of the greatest players of his generation. It could definitely be either, but again, I'm just gonna lean with my bias because I'm very biased on something like this and say that has to be Roy. That was also both, that, that literal yeah, line so was in the first paragraph <laughs> of both Wikipedia pages. So I think you've got, you got the first three right. Uh, I got six out of eight. Well, there are nine. Well, there's nine, and then the six out of nine maybe, geez. <laughs> it took you a while to catch on that I put some more laudatory quotes about Michael Aldrup in here. <laughs> you see, the, the problem is that you, you, someone like Roy is a, uh, for, you know, he was captain of Manchester United. So, you know, there's a lot of Manchester United fans in Ireland. There's also a lot of Liverpool fans in Ireland. So that's a bit of a, a dividing thing. And he was also at the centre of um, one of the biggest controversies ever, certainly in Irish sport, you, you know, it was a bigger controversy than Michelle Smith, um, was that Roy walked out of, got kicked out of the, the World Cup, uh, pre-World Cup training camp in 2002 for a fallout with, with the manager. Um, so um, there is probably 50% of Ireland that would um, agree with all those quotes being attributed to Roy, and there'd be 50% that would think that they could never be attributed to such a bad character. <laughs> well... I don't, I don't understand that because Michael Laudrup is uh, universally loved in uh, Denmark, so. We, we, we say, <laughs> joke with people back home, that this split that you see um, in families, in, in politics in the US at the moment, right. Irish people know exactly what that feels like because we split 20 years ago over Roy Keane and Mick McCarthy right. after the Saipan incident <laughs> before the World Cup. So. Yeah, it, so, so, so in Ireland, it's like, uh, 
Catholicism and Protestantism and then and then Roy Keane and Mick McCarthy or is it uh, do I have the order flipped? You probably in modern day you've got the order flipped, right? <laughs> Well, uh, Paul, it's been great. Thanks for playing with me. Thanks for talking about all that stuff. Um, uh, and uh, thanks for letting me come back to work and uh, coach again. <laughs> thanks my for signing pleasure. my paychecks, although you don't really sign them. I guess it's direct deposit, but you know, you know, you, you get it. It's, it's a figure of speech. My pleasure. Enjoying every minute of it, Chris. <laughs>